Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Monday Demystifying webinar in March. And we are still talking about collaborations using Universe. I hope everyone can hear me fine. Let us know if there is um, sound issues. And again, we are joined by Harry Frank, the senior artist who leads the development for the plugins in Maxon. And also Jason, the professional um, editor who has been delivering a lot of sports program and BAFTA winning um, programs. Um, and also, we also accompanied by Nick today. Nick is a master trainer. Is, uh, he is a master trainer of uh, uh, Red Giant. And today, we will talk more about the collaborative aspects in, in our workflow. So in the week one, we kind of um, shared about uh, shared some overviews about the uh, universe plugins. And then the second weeks, we also showed you some, um, some of our favorite and also some of the less used, but actually really uh, useful. And today, where we will start to show the collaborations aspect onto it, of it. And yeah, before we start, um, just a usual housekeeping. To check the upcoming events, uh, you can check maxon.net slash events. Um, there is uh, Ask the Trainer sessions coming up and also a 3D motion design show in March. And if you want to check the recording of this sessions or the previous sessions, you can head into it heads to our um, YouTube channel, Maxon Training Team, and there you can see all the previously recorded uh, sessions. Also, you can find these sessions uh, uploaded there um, as well later on, of course. And don't forget that you can also order free T-shirts using the code demystifying 3 Harry got one apparently. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, the address and the, the code, uh, you can find it in the, in, in the chat. And if you feel if you want to test your knowledge about the uh, Red Giant products, you can take some assessment in redgiant.com slash volume slash certifications, right? So without further ado, let us start with Jason, right? Jason, take it away. Cool, I'll just switch the screen over. So, okay, so hopefully everyone can hear me. So I'm working in AVID 2021.2 today. I might just turn off my monitor, so that one. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, I was going to start off with a lot of the work I do in broadcast is quite collaborative. Quite often we have editors, colorists, graphic people, online editors, there's a whole range of different jobs. Um, and this is an example of one of the reasons I like Universe is working in Avid, normally you would be editing and quite often the graphics will be delivered from somewhere else. But this is a little example of something we might use in sports, a little locator graphic. And the nice thing about having Universe in Avid is that I can build things like this in Avid. So you can see this is using the Universe Hacker tool. Um, and the nice thing is it allows me to transition from one set of text. So you can see here we have Moscow, Russia written in Russian Cyrillic text. And it allows me to have a cool little transition through to the English version of it. And then it mixes on and off. And that you can see it has a glow and various styles to it. Um, one of the things I'm going to do is this is an example of while I'm editing, I might sort of come up with a graphic to sort of sell the idea to the producer and say, what do you think of this as an idea? Like, especially if it's an English audience, we want it in English, but it's quite cool being if the location was Russia to have it written in Russian and you could do the same in each language. One of the cool things I like is you can see within the controls, I have animation timing and the main thing I like is the text transition type. So you can see here it goes from the Russian straight through to the English. Just go back into that tool and you can see when I hit the edit text button I can see the two different lines of text the source text and target text which I can see here 
Um, I can also use any font, which in this case, I've just used Arial for, for this example. Obviously, when you're collaborating, if you're using a font that's different to a standard font, you need to make sure you hand that font over as well. But for this case, we'll just stick with Arial because it's useful and everybody has Arial. So you can see I can type in my two lines of text. And then you can see here, this is something that's quite cool, the text transition type. We're just moving from the source to target and you can see the direction we're going randomly. So as I step through, you can see just different letters pop at different times. If I were to switch that uh, left to right, then obviously the text will go from one side to the other. So you can see it's doing it letter by letter. There's also sort of random flicking letters happening throughout it. But you can also go from source to target through random characters. I tend to use this more because it's quite cool. So you can see if we start here, different letters sort of change to sort of really random characters. And then once you've got a whole random string, it turns into English. So the nice thing I like here is if we go back into this, once I've got something that I quite like, because I don't want to spend all day playing with a graphic, I might save that as a style. So let's save a preset and I'll call it uh, Jason's Avid Hacker. So we'll save that. So now if we come into I'm on a Mac computer and within the documents in Red Giant, you can see I have a folder universe and within the presets, all of them live in here. And you can see here's the one we just made, Jason's Avid Hacker. Now what I can do is quite quickly, I can hand that over. So in this case, I'm gonna pass that to Harry so he can have a look at it and do a bit more with it. And this could be a perfect example of, I've done something in an edit which works well for our edit, but now to actually make it look good and to stylize it and tweak it a bit, we'll hand it over to Harry, who in this instance is gonna act as our graphics person. Um, I'm using WhatsApp just because of its simplicity. So you can see if I just grab this RGX file and drop this in here, Harry will then be able to pick that up. So this is just standard WhatsApp. It's only a tiny file, 66K. The nice thing is, as you've seen, I've just built this in Avid. Um, I'm, I imagine Harry's probably gonna use After Effects. The other thing is I'm on a Mac. Harry could be on a Windows computer. It doesn't matter either way. The RGX file is compatible with all of the different apps. You can use it in After Effects, Premiere, Avid, whatever you like. So now that Harry's got that, I might hand that over to Harry. So we'll sort of keep moving quite quickly because of the collaboration idea. So I'll change the presenter over to Harry and he can show you the other end of picking that up and someone else working on it. Yep, I'm grabbing it right now, show screen. Okay, so um, like Jason mentioned, we're using uh, WhatsApp, which uh, uh, it's actually, uh, that was interesting. Uh, it was kind of a new, I, I've never used the desktop version of this before. So we're trying to use Dropbox and we we're running into issues and this seemed like actually a, a pretty easy way to just share a file. So I'm taking his uh, preset that he made in Avid and just dropping it in my uh, universe presets right here. And there it is, it's in my documents, Red Giant Universe presets. Okay, sorry, uh, presentation's taking up a lot of room. There we go. Okay, so everybody can see uh, my screen, I hope. And um, I just wanted to take a moment to kind of go through uh, Hacker Text. You know, every time we do a release or, you know, when things are a new release, uh, we always, you know, we try to cover them via getting started tutorials. And then when we do updates, uh, we kind of do an update tutorial. Um, but you, when we do that and we add features that might kind of get lost in the shuffle and um, when you're trying to check out how to use this plugin, um, the sort of the complete set of features and, and how they all kind of work together. First thing I want to do is let's get that uh, preset loaded uh, that Jason sent. So if I choose a preset for hacker text, it should uh, there it is, Jason's Avid Hacker. And look at that, it worked. I had this, you know, if you ever uh, have um, like a dream before an event 
and uh, this, I, I kept worrying. Like, I hope, I hope this doesn't like. <laughs> I hope this doesn't screw up on me on a live broadcast. No reason it should, because it's just fine. Um, so one thing I noticed uh, was that Jason was uh, manually keyframing. Now, uh, the the preset files really just store the parameters. They don't store keyframe data. And that's one of the reasons uh, in this latest release, we added the animation timing section where you can automatically animate. And what it's going to do is go through the different stages of the animation. So actually, let me flip it back over to manual so we can see uh, exactly what's going on here. So uh, let's set this to 0, 1, 2, 3, and then 4 to 5. So what it, it does is it does the text wipe on. I'm going to turn off this glow for a second just so to keep things simple. So um, it will wipe the text on. And in this case, it's going in a random direction. Uh, so it's just kind of randomly, it's a random, I guess it's not really a white, but it's it's transitioning the text on. Um, so the text is on, and then we transition from one con one source to another. Uh, fundamentally, hacker text does a transition from what we call the source text to the target text. So text A, text B, or source and target. So we're transitioning from this first text to this second text. And then as the last stage of the animation, it does the outro. So it, it does the uh, transition in the opposite direction. Um, I'm gonna remove this suffix uh, piece right over here, just because I think um, I think it will work in a little bit more simple. Um, and I'll switch this to a right shift so it's kind of pointing that way. So instead of manually animating this, we can just set this to automatic. So this will go from, it'll animate on from zero to one. So from zero seconds to one second, it will animate that text on. Again, it's using random because I've chosen random right here. Um, if I switch this to left to right, it will animate it just kind of on like that, which also looks fine. Um, and then from two to three seconds, uh, it will transition the text from the source to the target. Now, what it's using to uh, transition here is it's pulling from a pool of letters. Um, and in here, the random characters that it chooses are the characters you can enable or disable. So you've got like a, like tilde or uh, what is uh, that is it's not even a tilde. It's like a proximate. I don't even know. Um, but that is in the random symbols group right here. So if I actually uncheck all of these and just leave it to custom text here, and I click on edit custom text, it uses a custom pool of uh, text that I can define here. So if I wanted to put like some uh, left bracket, right bracket, and you know, maybe an at, or I already have an asterisk in there. How about an underscore? We'll add that. So this will be the pool of characters that it uses to transition on. So again, uh, left, right, wipe. It does its uh, transition from source to target, and then it sits in the target text. Now, sometimes you want it to transition out. So again, in that animation stage here, four to five seconds, it transitions out. But if you want it just to sit there, you can just uncheck the outro, and it will just perpetually sit there. Also, this this timing, zero to one, two to three, four to five, et cetera, is all relative to the layer. So you don't have to like keep changing it if you move the the text down. I'm just keeping it at zero just to keep it um, easy to kind of see what's going on. Um, another thing that you're seeing is that sort of flickering. Um, like right here, you can see this character is kind of flickering in its scale. And this is also something that was added in the most recent version um, where you can enable a flicker where it will flicker the uh, scale. We can flicker the characters, um, the opacity. Uh, and right now it's flickering scale. If I turn that off um, and I say maybe flicker the characters, it's just going to do sort of a random character flickering. Now with Arial, this might not be great because this is not a monospaced font. So I'm actually going to go back into the text and let's put this to something monospaced. Um, if I type in the font here, it does kind of a smart search. Uh, does a match to the font name. And now 
there. So as it flickers the text, it's not changing the, uh, the kerning. And this uh, frequency is pretty straightforward. I'm gonna turn down this sustain. It's just sort of like how long it will leave that flickered uh, thing uh, in place. Oh, another thing to mention, um, Jason was mentioning using, uh, and this is no small feat, uh, using so yeah, basically this Russian uh, Cyrillic uh, alphabet. Um, in this, uh, I don't think, I think it was this release, or maybe one release before that, but we, we added support for a multitude of languages outside of just English, um, including right to left, you know, uh, 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 languages as well. But you just have to make sure that the the typeface that you're using actually supports it. Arial is pretty universal, so that worked pretty well. Uh, this PT Mono is uh, one of the open source fonts that we ship with Universe. Um, if you, oops, if you go to the documentation for Universe, oops, sorry. Some days I'm on Windows and some days on Mac and I scroll the wrong way. Uh, Regent Universe, there's a section called installed fonts and this gives you a list of all the, the open source fonts that we install. Uh, well, if you assume that you uh, opt in to install, there's an option to not install them. Um, but this allows you to uh, use the fonts that are used in the presets as well as, well, you can use them in your own presets and that way as you share them from one person to another. So I think that's probably pretty good. Maybe we'll change the color of this, maybe a terminal green, or I'm not sure what's gonna work here. We can always change this later in post. And then as Jason mentioned, we also have some simple post effects on here, such as a scan lines effect. Um, let me zoom in so you can see that. Um, I'll scrunch these together just a little bit more. And there's also a glow on here, which is a very, I mean, it's a, it's a very basic glow. It's just literally uh, like a simple glow that passes maybe, I think three times. So each one is just kind of scaling outward and kind of giving it a, a basic multi-pass kind of glow. Um, and I think that kind of covers kind of tweaking this and making this into a a uh, half decent effect. Not that it wasn't decent before. Um, yeah, do we have any, any questions? There's a comment in the chat, um, Harry. Um, yeah. Travis was commenting that it is a great job on Cyrillic to normal English font. He was kind of waiting for that to break it. it it was a huge request um, getting just, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a no brainer that we should just because these are developed, you know, in the, in the U S that we should just stick to plain American English fonts. It's just, it gets complicated uh, when you have um, all these, you know, this, this different character support and right to left and, you know, Chinese and Hebrew and all these things that, that uh, we had to, to test. Um, and I believe in the text settings, oh, now I'm forgetting where we put it, because fonts don't actually tell the computer, we don't have the ability to look at a font and say, oh, this is a right, left, right to left font versus left to right font. Um, so if your type is the other way, like, like in Arabic, um, it has to go the other way. And I, remember um, where we put that. Anyway, um, I don't want to take up all kinds of extra time. But um, so am I going to save this uh, preset now as uh, something to hand off in our in our great collaboration here? No, it's, yes. it's not necessary unless you want to. Oh, OK. I was going to make another quick thing that I can send to Nick and move it in a slightly different direction, but further collaboration. Okay. Well, that's, um, yeah. Well, I'll end it there. And um, if it comes back to me or any other questions, let me know. So I'll stop sharing.
Is there oh. any chance of there's a question in the in the, in the chat, um, Harry? Is there any chance of adding a few ba basic sound bites to supplement the effect in the program? We could uh, you, on my backlog of tutorials that I want to get to, at least in in After Effects. Um, I've used there's actually a very basic tone generator in After Effects, which probably nobody's ever used. But if you stack the the frequencies the right way, and you you can link in like put on put in some uh, basic expression expressions like a um, modulus modulus expressions, so that it will turn off the the volume like qu quickly, and you tie that tone sort of choppiness to the timing of your animation, you can get that sort of um, kind of audio sound blip kind of stuff. Deploying, you know, it, it could be something that we could uh, hand out outside of the installer, you know, like instead of putting sound effects and stuff like that into the, the installer package and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't, it's not a bad idea. Um, if we have time, I'll, I'll work up an example here. And if it comes back to me, um, if we have extra time, I can I can quickly show that idea of what I was talking about using the tone generator and, and just kind of doing some basic sound effects right within After Effects, if, if that's helpful, if that's the host app that uh, Beep is working in. That would be awesome. Thank you, Harry. Yep. Cool. So I, I'm back in Avid, and I was just going to put together another quick example, which we can send over to Nick. Obviously, this highlights one of the things with collaborating is it obviously slows the process down because each step takes time to hand over. So it tends to be something that happens on bigger projects. I know from the survey last week, about 70% of people act as a one man band. So they do their own graphics, audio and everything. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with teams of people. So collaboration is quite useful. You've also got an added advantage that if you send something to someone else quite often they can see a way to make it look better than how you might have done it by yourself. Um, but here's another little example of something you can do within any edit system and again you can hand this over. I've just got this map which is a fairly basic sort of color map and I want to make a little locator graphic. So within Avid what I'm doing is to zoom it in, Avid has an unusual way of doing things where we use reformat which allows me to frame. So you can see there's the big map which is the overall resolution of it. And I'm working in high definition, some 1920 by 1080. So you can see I can scale and position them. We get this box here showing me the bit I'm going to end up using. Um, there's also a color adapter, which I'm not going to play with. Now, the first thing I want to do is give this a look. So I'm going to use Red Giant Looks. And I've actually got one prepared to save time. But basically, you can see I've got it wound down to zero. If we bring it up to 100%, it's got a range of different tools. Um, I tend to sort of normally start with like I don't find a look that you like, apply it and then go and tweak it to make it what you want. Now this particular map was designed that I want to show a journey from me in London to Nick in Toronto. So I've sort of got the focus in the center area and you can see I've blurred the rest of the map. So we've got that focus is important. Now while I'm in here and I have this as I want it, we can hit this little button here and I can save this look. So if I call this, uh, Jason's map grade. We'll save that out. And then you can see our map. Put that back to 100%. So now you can see our map's got a distinctive look. Now, the next step I'm going to do is we're going to use the line tool, another universe tool. And this allows me to draw a line from one point to another. And you can see I prepared this earlier because obviously it takes a bit of fiddling. Now, all within this one tool, which this is very useful if you're in Avid or Premiere. Obviously, in After Effects, there's ways you could animate all the elements to do this relatively easily. Still not as easy as having a tool to do it for you. In Avid, this would take a huge amount of time and a massive stack of layers. But you could see in the details there over London, I have a little square icon thing that highlights our starting position. And it also generates text. So as soon as it comes up, it brings up our location text. This too is generated within the line tool. Uh, we then have a little line animate out to show our path from one point to our end point. And when it hits the end point, you can see another little icon animates out and the text. Now in Avid, I've actually keyframed all of these steps. You can see my keyframes here, which works the same as any other keyframes. So each point has its own 
sort of attributes. And like at the moment, you can see I'm using a four point bezier. If we make that three point, you end up with just a more simplified bend. But we'll stick with four point. I won't go into too much time here, but this is another example where I can build this up in while my edit, edit's happening with my producer sat next to me. We might be happy with this, but then we'll hand it over to someone else who's going to have a play with it. So again, we'll save this preset. So Jason's map line. Obviously, there's a load of control in here, and you can see like there's lots of different options. You can change the colors and the positions and the type of icons and rotations, and it goes on and on. <clears throat> I didn't want to sort of bore you with the individual details of every step. But what I'll do now is I'm going to share these two presets we just made. Um, so the same again if I come to my documents. In universe presets, we've got the map line that I just made. So I'll drop that in there. Um, the map I shared earlier, just to make sure everyone had that rather than waiting. You'll see also within the presets, we have magic bullet looks. So if I go into my presets here and custom, and you can see there's Jason's map grade. So if I drop that in there, they're now available to everyone I'm collaborating with. So at this point, so I've been on Avid, and I'll hand over to Nick now, who's going to pick it up and play with this map in Premiere, I believe. That is correct. I've, I've um, just received your message, Jason, through WhatsApp, and I will show that here on the screen here in a second. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let me head inside of Premiere. Does everyone see my screen now? Yep, that's perfect. Perfect. So I, I just wanted to show the WhatsApp thread. Here's your uh, map grade, and there was another element too that came in and I downloaded this as well as the looks preset that you gave me, Jason. And I'm here inside of Premiere Pro. And I've sort of assembled a few things. So I'm heading over into my effect controls and all I did was applied a fresh version of Magic Bullet Looks. And then once I installed it in that location that you've already uh, shared on, in the documents folder, I'm simply just going in to edit the look. And inside of looks, I like to use the shortcut key L to bring up the looks gallery. And then it, here's your preset grade because of that location. And I love the fact that you kind of included a few different variations of looks here uh, with all of the tools inside of looks to create this uh, stylistic map look. So that was step one. And then step two was to repeat the same thing with universe line. And I actually have a workspace saved with um, the Red Giant Universe panel dashboard docked, uh, where I can easily add from the motion uh, graphics category line to a clip here in the timeline. And I also try uh, during these workflows to make sure that under my um, sequence menu, that selection follows playhead is turned on. This automatically comes on in the Lumetri panel when you sorry when you go into your Lumetri or color correction workspace but this is really handy when you're trying to apply universe effects as well as transitions so i applied a universe line and you can see it here and one thing about uh, working with this in premiere pro which i love is when you select the effect and effect controls of universe line i can make some additions in terms of the position of the line in case it needed some retweaking such as the location here and I'm just now dragging this on-screen control directly in my program monitor to make that adjustment to the line. I can also, of course, go into some of the line properties. And if the producer is coming back here and doesn't like, let's go here to the primary line, the dashed line style, I could come here and switch that to a solid. Now, on top of this, so I've got looks, I've got universe line, and then there's a transform effect just after, which is this scaling effect added at the very end. So it's scaling up on all of these assets. And because I'll be collaborating with a few other people in Premiere Pro on this project, and I know that they'll be working in Premiere Pro, rather than save this as a universe effect, because I'm utilizing in this case a Premiere Pro effect, the transform, I'm going to select this bundle of effects and just save this as a preset to be used inside of Premiere Pro. And I'll just call this map look and move. 
And once this is set up, I'll press OK. And if we head into the effects preset section, we should see that that map look and move is located right here. You can actually right click this and export this as a preset and save that anywhere on your system. And notice that that same action, let's say on a preset folder, is your way to import that preset. And what's going to happen? In fact, if I cleared these effects or applied it to a new map, uh, all three of those effects are going to be added onto it. So it's now just repeating itself. Let me just turn off the original. And I've got that collection of effects, not to mention the keyframes that um, were set up here. So pretty cool there of uh, being able to save that effect. So it just so happens that I actually am uh, working on two jobs at once right now. And uh, with the other job, uh, this is going to be a collaboration between three different uh, applications. So one is Final Cut, and I need to send over some stuff into After Effects for some final compositing. And then after I do that, I need to send this over to Max in Resolve for some final color correction. So I need some way of uh, being able to transfer these files back and forth between the various applications. So right here in the background, I'm going to head over into Final Cut and just show you what I have here. This is uh, just a sequence inside of Final Cut. Uh, I actually have an earlier version of Harry's text over here that I applied over this video and then used a gradient called Spectralicious just to darken the actual uh, video footage behind here uh, using a, gra a grad filter. Now this, uh, is a few things going on here. So this is a compound clip, or that's what Final Cut calls a compound clip, but it's a nest. And inside this nest are two layers, layer or two clips. The clip number one uh, has uh, basically a area here where I had to key out the green screen inside um, the actual computer monitor. So I just wanted to show that. So I used this keyer inside of Final Cut to key out that area. And then I added or scaled down this clip right here that's underneath it, which has two universe effects. So Noir Modern and then VHS, which is really responsible for some of those lines that you see there on the screen. Now, the problem is um, this footage is not tracked to the shot. And while there are third party effects that I could essentially use, I know that someone could set this up or do this in After Effects. And there happens to be um, a lovely uh, plugin that you can use that will translate your Final Cut Pro projects to After Effects, maintaining uh, the majority of transformative effects or any effects that are shared between the two applications. So here, I'm going to head in to that clip for AE. And I'm just going to save this as an XML. So I want to export an XML, save this to the desktop, create a new folder, XML, create a 4AE uni, and I'll press save. And I'm going to hop inside of After Effects and show you uh, this plugin. It's called Automatic Duck. What it's going to do is it's going to take that XML and try to transfer it to a After Effects project. So heading to the file menu, this is already installed. It's called X Import AE. And what's cool about it, if I go here to the desktop and let me go here to date added. Here's the XML. I'm going to choose to just to show you the settings down here. It's going to take all of my video clips or the actual nest that I sent and step up any layers in a comp if they were laid out sequ sequentially. And if I had any uh, pre-comp clip or clips in secondary storylines or compound clips, it will create pre-comps from it. Now, it gets even better for when we open it. I actually didn't see one of the effects. And that's the one that's inside of Final Cut. So let me just sort of show this to you in the timeline. Uh, here's the uni for AE. I'll open that up and you'll notice that it didn't see the keyer, and that's because the keyer is native to 
final cut. And in fact, it even gives you a marker to say, hey, there's a, a keyer missing. But the good part about it is I know that After Effects has a keyer and I could easily apply key light to this video clip to fix this up or to have the motion graphic designer do this, do just this. So I will take the screen color and just key that out so that we're back to square one. But here's the great part is that anyone who has universe, those effects are seen. So it actually kept the Noir Modern and the universe VHS effects and the transformative effects that were inside a Final Cut. So I scaled down that clip and repositioned it so that it would fit the monitor. All of that data is maintained, um, allowing this easy translation uh, between two applications that um, are, are separate. So if you ever work with someone in Final Cut, this X import AE might provide a cool kind of workflow. From here, I use the AE camera tracker and then after that utilization of the AE camera tracker, I'll actually just show the final version of this here so that we see some of the final steps. I added the AE camera tracker and then I added a null to the scene, uh, so camera and a null, and then attached this clip to the null, positioning it in space, sorry, the um, background clip here. So that's attached to a null and following this null that's uh, basically implemented by the uh, camera inside of After Effects. And then I added a few additional effects here just to comp these a bit better together. I added a match grain effect, um, a universe blur to blur this out a bit. And while I still have to play with the color correction of this to match these monitors better, I also applied a, an effect called color link, which in fact is native inside of After Effects and is gonna sample the colors of my clip or the shot with the two monitors by choosing in this instance i think i chose um, an average sample with a blending mode of screen and in order to make sure i saw this video clip i sense i stenciled the original alpha so to give this back to the editor in final cut i just or the motion graphic designer is going to come here under the composition menu and add this to the render queue where they're going to save out a Apple ProRes 422 file. So, uh, because they've finished with all of the VFX work, and I'm going to just take that and then share that with Max. And it just so happens that I've already done this, so to spare you the time of exporting that out, here's the Apple ProRes 422 file that actually exists above these two clips. You can see there that it does maintain the tracking from the AE camera tracker and the additional effects. And now, I need to get this over to Max. So Max has the same clips on his system. All I need to do is say, share with him an XML. Uh, on top of sh sharing with him an XML, I'm giving him a reference movie, so a low res proxy so that he can compare what I've done in this timeline, uh, in essence, to, so what I've done in this timeline to what he's gonna see inside of Resolve. And there's a way that he can actually link up um, this offline file so that he can compare to make sure all of the transformative effects and anything that I've changed uh, is maintained. So here I've selected this project and the same project where I'm gonna now export an XML, the difference for this being that it's for resolve. And now Max is gonna take this and do some finalization because you have all of those files, correct? Yes, Nick. Awesome. So let me send this over to you, Max. Awesome. So yeah, um, thank you very much, Nick. Um, just a uh, just a quick note um, that all these presets that we are using. Um, it will be available in the YouTube uh, recording. So once we uploaded the, the the video from today, and you can find all these presets in the in the descriptions as well. So um, I hope you can see my screen um, well. I have a Resolve Project Manager um, going on here, and now I will create a new uh, project to conform the project that Nix has shared with me. 
So I can just uh, select create project and then just name it conform, click create. And then now we are in resolve. And the first thing that I would like to do normally when I want to conform is that I will set my project settings. And in this case, I will stay in full HD uh, timeline resolutions and the same uh, timeline frame rate like my editor used, in this case, Nick. Also, I would define the color management at this stage as well. So for the color science, I am um, staying with a DaVinci YRGB and opting out not to use um, Resolve Color Management in this case. So I will stay in DaVinci YRGB and then that's it. So um, the first thing that uh, the first thing that I want to do when I want to conform it is that I will bring all the timeline that Nick um, sh shared with me. And in this case, you can just go to the edit page. And from the edit page, I will close my effects library. So from the edit page, um, I will access file and import timeline. And the shortcut for that is control shift I. So now I will head into my desktop where I got the file from Nick. And I will select the timeline and just simply press open. Now I have this dialog and this dialog is telling me uh, the source file is this one. And then what is the imported timeline and then the timeline name. And here I have the options to let the project settings to be automatically set. I didn't want that. I don't want that because previously I already set my project settings. And in this case, I can just deactivate this one. So the second option is to automatically import source clips into media pool. Yes, I do want that. And I will just press OK. And now Resolve telling me that Resolve cannot find the clips. Um, and in this case, I can uh, tell Resolve where to look into that clips. And I will just press yes. And now I will tell Resolve where to find those clips. And since I have my clips in desktop, so I will just select my desktop and select the folder and press OK. And as you can see, the timeline is now inside Resolve and also all the media are in. So this is the, the great example where, where everything went well, where there is no problem and so on. So let me just uh, fit my timeline by pressing Shift Z. And um, since Nick has kindly provided me a reference movie, I can cross check um, the, the timeline that I have with the reference movie that Nick already uh, sent me. In this case, I go back to media and then I will go back to my desktop folder. Desktop and then I will open the reference movie and I will bring the reference movie into Resolve. And to do that, I simply can just drag and drop it. But to keep things organized, I will create a new bin and call it reference. All right. And I will now just drag my reference movie into my media pool. And now I have the media uh, reference movie into in, in my media pool. So what I will do next is to go to edit page. And in the edit page, we have two uh, viewers. The viewers on the left is the source viewers, and then the viewer on the right is the timeline viewer. So um, normally you use the source viewer to preview your clip by double clicking it and it will load in this source viewer. But in this case, I want to use my source viewer as an offline viewer, and I can do that by pressing this drop down arrow and select offline. And I can bring in my reference movie just by drag and dropping the reference movie into my um, offline reference viewer. And now I can just scrub the timeline to see if everything match. 
So the viewer on the right is my timeline viewer, and the viewer on the left is my offline reference viewer. So in this case, everything is okay, and I can just go to color page and start coloring. But if we go to the last clip, you see that um, the text and then the double doubling effects is not there yet. So in this case, what I would do is like, I will call Nick and ask him what are the plugins used for this one and if he could share the same presets to me. And we did that already. And it was, it turned out it's, it's a screen text, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Nick, right? So what I can do is that screen text. Sorry, screen yeah, text. A, yeah, it's um screen text, and then there is uh, the doubling effect is modes. Modes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in this case, I can uh, open my effects library first, and then search for the screen text, and then drag and drop my screen text into the clip. Now, how do I um, access all those parameter? And I can do so by selecting the clips and choosing the inspector. And under effects, I will have my uni screen text, universe screen text. And then now I can just browse the presets that Nick already shared with me. And I can just apply the preset. Um, now I can also do the same with modes. And that's um, how you do conform, and that's how uh, when when that's the the best case scenario when conforming went well and there is no issue. But in this case, I want I would like to show you some some issues when conforming, since we know that these two softwares are not the best buddy in the playground. The the software A want you to do the more editing and coloring in in the app and then also the same with the software b so sometimes there could be trouble and then when when you encounter that trouble sometimes the the manual interventions are needed so let me just create a new project create a new project and i will name it conform underscore problem and create. I'll close my effect library, I'll close my inspector, I'm still in the edit page. So just to um, strengthen the, the learning process, we'll do the same uh, conforming uh, step. So I will bring in my timeline by clicking Control shift i or the command is File, Import, Timeline. And I will now go to the, the problematic XML and I'll click open. And just the same like before, I have my project set up already. So I don't need my projects uh, to be automatically set up because it will make my timeline resolutions to this value. So I'll just disable that and then proceed. Yes, I want resolve to find the file and it is in my desktop. Where is it? All righty. Okay. Now, as you can see, I still have one clips out of seven were not yet found. So in this case, I already tell Resolve where to look for the media, but still there is a missing clip. I really don't know what's, uh, what, what, what is the problem. So I will not ask Resolve to search for um, the, that particular clip. And I will cancel the search. Now you will have an information of what's going wrong by reading the log file. It seems like this um, composition uh, is missing. So what you can do is wait until resolve finish processing for sure. And what I will do next is to bring my reference uh, movie into my offline viewer. So in this case, I'll go to media again.
and go to clip for Monday. There you go. Create a new bin, name it reference, drag my reference movie in, go back to edit page, make sure the source viewer is an offline viewer, and just drag and drop my reference movie. So now I got everything set. Now I'm ready to scrap, uh, scrub my timeline. So as you can see, I still have media on, offline here. So I have to find that media in my media folder. So I will, what I will do is I will switch back my uh, offline viewer as a source viewer, and I will check for, um, for the missing clip. And it seems like the missing clip is this one. So what I can do is I can just switch that clip into this one with, with the one in the timeline. So I can just select that clip. Again, select that clip and select the clip in the timeline. Right click and conform lock with media pool clip. And there you go. And if I go back to my offline viewer, you see that it's the same clip, but without the um, comp. So if I move forward, as you can see, it's also different in, in, the, in the timing as well. Seems like Nick has just used part of the clip. And in this case, I have to uh, trim the clip. And to do so, I will just use the trim edit mode. And I will use my timeline viewer to compare the two clips. So to do that, I will right click the timeline viewer and then select mix wipe. And I will just trim my timeline, uh, my, my clips in the timeline. Or let me go back to no wipe until you'll see the, the subject entering the screen. Now I have the subject entering the screen, but I don't think it's the match uh, uh, time-wise, it's a, it's a match in the, in the time. So to do so, I can just compare it with the mix wipe. And as you see, I still have ghosting effects here, it means that it's not exactly the correct time. I can also use the difference mode. And as you can see, it's not perfectly uh, matched. And to do so, I can just use um, comma or full stop to move my clips one frame to the left or one frame to the right. So here I'll just move my one uh, my clip one uh, using comma, and I will just move it until I get no ghosting effects. And there. And if I switch to difference, all looking good. So I'm good to go, and switch it back to no wipe. So um, in this case. I can go forward and check again, the same problem. You just need to uh, bring in the presets and bring in the plugin. And now, as you can see, I still have the green screen. And in this case, what I can do is that I can call Nick to, um, to send me the baked versions of the clip or to send me the map of the clip so that I can um, use it for coloring later on. So there is also one method for conforming. So for example, if you want everything to be baked and you can just take your baked uh, video as, a, as, a, as, a, as your source to, to color grade, you can do so by using the scene cut detector in Resolve. So for example, you can ask your editor to send you the ProRes 444 video. And then what you can do is that in the media pool, in the media storage, you can just go to the movie, not the reference movie, but I just have the reference movie. So here, but I will just use this as an example. So if, if you, for example, have a baked uh, movie, uh, ProRes 444, for example, you can just right click 
that particular file and then select scene cut detections and then now you can just press auto scene detect and it will detect all the cut that you have in your um, edit and it will separate one video into several different clips and by doing so you can color grade it independently separately and then you can move forward by pressing add cuts to media pool so i don't want to do that i will go back to the previous uh, conform since it was the the correct conform process and we'll take a look into one look how i will tackle the color grading in this one so going back to editing all look good and then i will just switch to color page so for example here how i tackle the grade um, is that for example if i want to establish a, a bleach bypass look on this one since it's a hacky theme and um, computer related theme i think the the correct look that that goes well with this one is the bleach bypass look of course you have to ask the producer or the director about the look you have to consult them if it's um in line with their visions um, with their aesthetics so for in, for instance we're going for a bleach bypass look um, bleach bypass is actually a look that um, rooted from originated from a color timing process which is a skipping a bleach bath uh, when you are developing a film and bleach bath is actually um, a process where you're stripping off the the silver silver content content of the of the film and then exchanging it exchanging it with the color dye to get your um, color in the in the film so by understanding that process we can we can understand that we can come into conclusions that bleach bypass is actually a a color film superimposed on the on the on the monochrome image so we can do do so um by doing by doing by increasing the contrast and then reducing the saturations right so for example if i want to increase my contrast we're, we're switching gear to color grading now um, so I can do so by increasing my contrast change the pivot point of the contrast and then also reduce the saturations it looks okay but it's like it lacks some control how if I want to have some more controls in my grade well you can do so by um, separating the adjustment and I will walk you through my process um, which I learned from Kevin Shaw. He's a very great um, color colorist, and then also a great teacher as well. As well, so check out his uh, channel. His website is a finalcolor.com. So um, I will steal this look from Kevin, and I will just reset my note, reset note grade. And what I would do here is that I will turn first, I will turn my image into black and white by using the RGB mixer. And I will switch monochrome, increase the red channel, decrease the green channel. I turn off the preserve luminance. And then from there, I can create a parallel node double click uh, right click and add node layer I'm adding a layer node not not a parallel node so I have here I have a black and white image and here I have the saturations I have the color image so in this node I want to tackle the saturations issue and I will just reduce the saturations a little bit since now I am in a layer node, I can uh, take benefit of the blending mode. And, and to do so, I, I will just right click this particular uh, layer node 
and select the composite mode and choose one of the blending node. And in this case, I like the color dodge a lot or the linear dodge. And then after that, I can go and create a wash look on top of that. So for example, reduce the temperature a little bit, add the green tint, and decrease the saturations in the highlight by doing so, by going to the lum versus sat, luminance versus saturations curve, and then just drop the, the, the highlight area points over there and creating another pivot point like so. And now I'm pretty much done with my bleach bypass look. And I can do so, uh, I can do the same treatment with another, uh, with the other clips. And to do so, I can start balancing and matching my clips to the first one and proceed from there. So that is the workflow for conforming. Hope it's it's been helpful. And I think I will give uh, give it back to you, Harry, since um, you want to talk a little bit about the tone, right? About the audio bits in universe. Yeah. Hey, there. Sorry, awesome. I had to run and grab my my copy. Uh, no worries. Yeah. So let's do this. Um. Share, no. Should make you presenter first. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. You know, as I was showing um, hacker text and I was trying to find a feature, uh, which is to enable uh, right to left text, I realized uh, it's it was a feature that was added to typographic. So we added right to left support just before we released typographic. So I put, it was put into that. But actually, this was a good reminder and actually wrote up the task for me because I have to go back into Hacker Text and some of those older text plugins to uh, add right to left text support. We have to put in a menu because like I was saying, we can't auto detect if, if it's Arabic, it needs to go the other way. We have to put in a menu to define, is this left to right or right to left text? So right now, if you use Hacker Text and you put in something like Arabic, it will be backwards because we have to define it to write the other way. So anyway, hopefully, uh, well, not hopefully, I will get that in the, in the next release. Um, okay, so we were talking about, somebody was asking about sound effects uh, with regard to, um, oh, did I? Okay, I was experimenting with Arabic text here. So uh, let, me, let me just, um, re oh, there, there we go. Actually, let me undo and put this back on, and then I will just use some text that is not Arabic. Uh, um, oh, I don't have the original text, but I'll just type. Um, we'll just two do do two different cities, two very contrasting cities: Detroit, Michigan, and then Moscow, Russia. Just so we have two different type, two different uh, source and targets. So we're, we were talking about, you know, as all computers do, let out lots of bleeps and bloops as the text uh, types on. And uh, I'm going to disable this flickering so it's not actually having my text jump around like that. I had changed this to Arial because I was experimenting with Arabic and PT Mono doesn't support Arabic, so I had to go back to Arial. Okay, now there's a, this is a monospace mod. So as I mentioned, there is a, a plugin in After Effects you've likely not used uh, under audio called Tone. And it is simply a tone generator. You, you apply this to a solid and it generates not just one, but like five different audio tones. They're just, they're sine waves, or I guess you can change it to different types of, uh, basic audio waveforms. I was just, I'm gonna stick with using the sine wave. So um, I'm gonna copy my, 
expression and get that out of there and let's just reset this. So it, it goes to a very random set of frequencies. So if I um, hit play, particularly, I don't know, are you never done audio in one of these? Are you hearing that weird sort of UFO sound effect? This will be... No, Harry. Oh, okay. Um, let's, uh, okay. Hmm, this might be disappointing if um, we can't actually hear it. Let me output this just through some speakers and I'll just turn it up. Uh, this is probably the easiest way to do this on the fly. Okay, let me turn you way up. And I'm gonna turn up this a lot louder than I, okay. Now it's just distorting. We still cannot hear you. Um, probably it's it's some settings in the go to webinar where you can share um, audio. Okay. Yeah, that's a, let's see. Oh. I don't see any audio. Is there any any settings in the share? Settings. My audio. Uh, Include media very... sounds. I don't see that. Um, well, is this something I should go ahead and do, or do you? I know people don't want to see, sit here and watch us play with uh, uh, audio preferences. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and show. Yeah, as, as Simon's mentioning, I'll sh I'll show it anyway, and then maybe we can do a better version of this. But uh, I hate to get us this far and then just not show what I'm talking about. Pretend you hear sound. Um, so tone, <laughs> tone, the tone plugin, it it really just generates a bunch of sine wave tones, right? And um, so for sort of that audio blippy kind of sound, um, if we change these frequencies to much higher frequencies, but still kind of fairly random, like let's say, and this this is in hertz, right? So 12,000 hertz is kind of high. Uh, the top end of human hearing is usually somewhere around 16, well, depending on your age, 20,000 hertz. Most people hear comfortably somewhere around 16,000 hertz. So let's say we do like 8,000, 12,000, I'm sorry, yeah, 12,000, 8,000, maybe 1K, and then I'll just set the rest of these to zero. And what that would do is just give you sort of a a drone sound, like it would just be a steady state drone uh, sound. And what we want to do is sort of make it choppy, where it turns on and off uh, quite quickly. And uh, so let me just message me on Slack. Um, and the way we do this quickly, I mean, you could keyframe it, but this is where expressions come in handy. So what we want to do is just, I want to get out a, a, a numeric count of my current frame. Right, so if I'm at frame 30, I want a value of 30. If I'm at frame 70, I want a frame, I want a value of 70. We have a constant uh, readout of time in seconds because time is constant between all projects, but frames are not constant between all projects. If you're running at 24 frames per second versus 18 frames of, or 30 frames a second, so a frame is not a frame, and that's why frame, oh, that's why expressions never directly measure things in frames, it measures them in time. But I can convert uh, time to frames using the native uh, function, time to frames. And then in the parentheses, I just put the word time. So what it's going to do is take this word time, which is a, a live readout of the current time, my, my playback time. So at you know three seconds, time equals three. And then it's going to convert that to frames, right? So as I play this, you can see and it might be small for you, but as I as I scrub, you'll see that the level is just slowly growing over time. And this isn't what we want to do. I'm just illustrating that the value output is changing over over time. So what I want to do is take this numeric value that's that's just slowly slowly growing over time, and use something called modulus. Modulus is super useful in expressions. Modulus, if you've not worked with it before, um, modulus is is simply 
the remainder after dividing a number. So if I divide this number by two, what is what is the remainder? So if we're using two, it's either gonna be even or it's not gonna be even, right? So the, the output of a modulus two or mod two, sometimes we say, uh, is just gonna alternate between zero and one. So now if I hit enter, you'll see that it's just flickering back and forth between zero and one. Now that's zero and 1%, which is not very loud. Um, so I can take this whole thing, uh, probably good practice to put everything in parentheses. It might not matter because I think modulus is processed, calculated first, but still, um, if I say times 20, this will now flicker back and forth between zero and 20. Or I can even use the existing value of this level. So whatever I've, whatever I am using here, pre-expression, so let's say I have this set to 17 or whatever, the expression now will flicker back and forth between zero and 17, which I think is a, a cleaner way of doing it. So now how you get this to sync up, there, you know, there's the comp, there's the easy or the less complicated way. You know, I could just use the split command or split clip and just, you know, split this every time I want to uh, have animation uh, or sound effects with the animation. You know, th this is the the debate, like what's, that was actually a lot quicker for me to do that than to write the expression uh, to do this automatically. Uh, but I'll show the expression because there's lots of checks that we have to do if we're using this with uh, hacker text. So let me hit, uh, so there's um, a number of things I have to check for, right? I have to check to see if we actually have uh, animation enabled, right? Because I don't want the sound effect of playing if I've disabled any of those animation stages, right? So if I've said, you know, if I don't want intro animation, so I don't want the sound effect playing. So I have to establish a few um, variables that are going to check to see if it's even selected. Sorry, I'm going to move a window that you probably can't see. Okay, so we check all those and then I have to grab the times of each of the intro. So we've got, uh, let me go back to the plugin here. We've got where the animation section is. We've got the that wipe intro start time and end time. We have the animation start and end time and the outro start and end time. So for any of these situations, if it is on and the time is in between those two values, we want to play the sound effect. So that's that's essentially all this this junk is right here. It's just all me just checking to see is it checked? Yes, it's checked. If it is checked, then um, well, right here I'm saying if it is checked, then we are going to assign the value to this word intro start, which is just a variable. Uh, and we'll assign that value up here of this text wipe intro start value. So we're just grabbing all of these values here, the start, the intro start, the intro start and end, transition start and end, outro start and end. And we're assigning all those values. And then down here, I'm just saying, if the time, again, we talked about that, if the current time is greater than the intro start and less than the intro start, or it is greater than the transition start and uh, less than the transition end, or it is greater than the outro start and uh, end, then if all that or any of those cases are true, we do this. And that's, that's the exact uh, expression that I did earlier. So, a little bit, you know, this is like, well, is that easier than just breaking the clip up? I don't know. But, it, you know, if you had a bunch of these to do and you wanted it all automated, um, this would certainly make life a lot easier. In fact, I think if I say, um, if I show the, if I show the waveform, I think this should be post expression. I guess not. I thought. Oh, wait, uh, uh, is that graphs? Do the graphs have to be post expression? Oh, I thought I could get the waveform to show post expression values. But I guess not. Well, as you can see, the level is, is kicking in where uh, the animation is happening. But if I have the, the animation disabled, it's not there. So if I check that, then we've got, we've got the animation plane. We'll post this, oh, there it goes. There we go. 
So if I change this outro, let's say we want it to stay a little bit longer and I change the outro now to happen at seven seconds, we can see that the little blips are happening now over there. Or if I, let's say, I have this animation take a little bit more time, now it's gonna go between two and four seconds. So it's one of those uh, classic situations. What's what's quicker to just do the, the quick and easy way uh, or to invest more time to um, write the expression and um, make it a lot more flexible. Apologies that you couldn't hear it, but um, uh, we'll post the project. So hopefully that's helpful. And thank you very much, Harry. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Jess Jason. And thank you, Nick. Um, that's it for today. And uh, I hope the collaborative um, example that we uh, showcase today uh, could be some help of you uh, folks, right? So um, just another note, um, you can check the recording of this sessions um, in our YouTube channel. So just search for Maxon Training Team in YouTube and you will see, you'll be able to see the recording of the sessions. So thank you for, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Harry. See you next week.